Okay, so I'll start. I'll start with the punchline, the the summary of the the summary of the talk. Uh, there will be some new words that I will introduce, but the 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 result is actually very. You can formulate it and yeah, very very quickly. So there is there are three things. One is the well, given tiles R matrix for Witten's R spin plus. Witten's R spin class, and I'm counting the words that I will have to explain. <laughs> the second one is also given tall, given tall's R matrix. Okay, I'll, I'll rewrite it. For the gromov witten theory of, uh, proje of projective space of CPN. And the third one is the Asymptotic expansion, asymptotic, asymptotic expansion uh, at well as x goes to infinity of the solutions of this uh, of this differential equation of phi of x satisfying. Well, n plus first derivative of phi is equal to x to the power s times phi of x. And the, okay, so the first two are actually the first non-trivial examples of cohomological field theories. So, let's say examples three and four of cohomological field theories. If you introduce cohomological field theories, first you give two trivial examples, and these are the next two ones, which are the, <coughs> the first non-trivial examples. And the statement is that these three things, two R matrices and this asymptotic expansion, are all the same. So this was partly known for uh, so for Witten's class and s equals one, I will tell you in a well. I will tell you later what was known. So now I have to introduce cohomological field theories, Witten's class, uh, right? And the and given tiles, given tiles are matrix. S? s is a parameter. You will see the role of the parameter. You it will appear. So s is just s. Uh, yeah, s is a is a real number. Uh, okay, so the thing is, I at some point I gave a six hours lecture course on on cohomological field theories and our matrices. So now it will be half an hour, so it will be extremely efficient, maybe a little bit sketchy, but I'll try to I'll try to explain as much as <coughs> as possible. And then people who know it already can can sleep during half an hour, and then I'll wake you up in the end. Can you say what is X? What is Oh, x is a x is a variable. It's the the parameter. So it's the. This is the. D n plus one. Phi with respect to. D x n plus one. Just just one variable. Yes. Okay. So first of all, what is a cohomological field theory? So I will, I will start by example using these two examples since we have these two examples. So a cohomological field theory is a bunch of bunch of cohomology classes, cohomology classes on Mg and bar. So the moduli space of uh, uh, stable curves of genus G with n marked points. Like this is genus 1, for instance. I have an example on my, <laughs> my t-shirt. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> so for, for, all, for all G and n. <coughs> so it's a collection of cohomology classes on different moduli spaces of uh, stable curves with, of genus G with n marked points. So how does it work? Uh, for the Gromov-Witten theory, so let's let's say let's call W uh, 
the cohomological field theory Witten's R spin class, and omega will be the cohomological field theory that corresponds to <coughs> the gromov witten theory of uh, projective space. So first of all, we put, um, uh, well, at every marked point, here we have n marked points, we put, so, on every marked point, marked point, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll start with omega, it will be a little bit better. So on every marked point, we put an A that goes from 0 to N. And this means that the corresponding marked point on the curve will have to go through a hyperplane to the power A in CPN. And then we take the cycle so curves, curves in MGN bar that can be mapped to CPN in such a way that so we, we fix we fix the eighth power of the hyperplane for every marking in such a way that f of the ith marking, so let me, c will be the curve and x1, x, xn will be the markings <coughs> and then it maps to CPN. So the image of the, the image of the ith marking lies inside, well the eighth power of a hyperplane, so actually a, <coughs> a projective subspace of codimension A. And usually at this point you also fix the degree of the map, but uh, I will not fix the degree. So usually there is also some parameter q to the power d, where d is the degree of the map, degree of f. But we will not do that, so I, I'll cross it out. I plug q equals 1, and this will be a cycle of mixed degree. So for different degrees of the map f, this cycle will have different dimensions and they just, just take the sum of them all. <coughs> so for every genus and for every collection of numbers A, A1, An, a given curve could have many maps. Well, it's a, it's a cycle, so it's a, it's a if, uh, well, if for every curve you have many maps, it's, it means the cycle is zero. So the, the proper way is to say that you look at the space of maps and then you project it to MGN bar. So for all G, for, for any G, for any N, for any collection of A1, AN from zero to N, you get a cycle in MGN bar. Okay, so Witten's class works uh, in a similar way, except that the, the, the cycle you get is completely different. But the framework is very similar, which is why they are both cohomological field theories. They satisfy the same property. So, on every marking, here we put a remainder, again we put an A, from 0 to r minus 2. So from this point on, in order to treat both theories in parallel, I will set n equals r minus 2, or r equals capital N plus 2. And then I will be able to talk about, <coughs> about both theories in parallel. And then, um, so then you look at the space of 1 over r differentials, differentials, let me call, call it gamma for instance. 
such that gamma to the power r, so if you take a 1 over r differential, gamma to the power r will be a differential. <laughs> and I, will, I want it to have zeros of orders ai at the marked points. So this should be a section of the cotangent line bundle twisted by sum of ai xi. So it's a, well, it's a, a 1 over r differential. It is actually a section of a line bundle that is a, an rth tensor root of this, of this line bundle. Then when you raise it to the power r, you get a section of this line bundle with zeros of fixed orders at the, at the marked points. And uh, here I add this magic word virtual, virtual cycle. So actually, if you look at, um, uh, if you study 1 over r differentials like that, you will see that most of the time uh, <coughs> the rth tensor root of this line bundle has no sections. So the only 1 over r differential is the 0 1 over r differential. But even this is too much, because there is a 0 1 over r differential on every stable curve. And actually, the, if you compute the virtual dimension, it is smaller. So this thing cuts out a cycle inside. So this is a cycle in cohomology class in mg and bar. So again, for any genus, for any n, for any collection of AIs, you have a, you have a cycle. Uh, well, you have a cohomology class in mg and bar. And now I will write the main, the main axiom. So cohomological field theories have several axioms. I will write one main axiom, the main property. of cohomological field theories, that's the factorization property. So, there's a map Q from mg minus 1 and plus 2 bar to mg n bar. That is obtained by taking a stable curve with genus minus 1 with n plus 2 marked points and gluing the last two marked points together. So, so here you have a curve of genus 3 with 5 markings and then you took two markings and glued them together and you obtain a curve of genus 4 with three markings. And you may ask what is the pullback under the map Q of the cohomological field theory? So let's take omega, but it's the same formula for Witten's class. Omega Gn of A1 An. And the answer is that it is again given by the same cohomological field theory applied to this smaller moduli space. So this is equal to actually sum over a prime plus a double prime equals capital N omega g minus 1 n plus 2 a1 a n a prime a double prime. So let me say it again. You have this moduli space mg n bar on which you have a cohomology class omega gn of a1 a n. Then you restrict this cohomology class on a boundary divisor uh, composed of nodal curves with one node. And you see that this boundary divisor is actually almost isomorphic to, us, to another moduli space. And on this moduli space you also have uh, cohomology class is given by the same cohomological field theory because the cohomological field theory gives cohomology classes on all moduli spaces. So the axiom tells you that uh, the pullback of the cohomological field theory on the bigger moduli space is equal to the cohomological field theory on the smaller space. Except that uh, here you have two extra marked points and the cohomological field theory only gives you a cohomology class when you assign uh, these numbers ai to marked points. So you need two more ais. And then you take the sum. So you take the sum over a prime and a double prime. These are the two extras. 
<coughs> that you plug here. Okay. So this was the extra short introduction to cohomological field theories. And now it is followed by another extra short introduction to R matrices. So for this uh, Clark TW, do you mean you take the this, this bigger modular space of curve together with differential and you push it down to MGM bar? Is, is this no, so a cohomological field theory is a family of cohomology classes of MGN bar, right. on, on MGN bar. So you do not have to remember how they were obtained. So this is a definition of a cohomological field theory. It's a cohomology class on MGN bar. Once you have it, you forget about one over R differentials. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm just asking, do you, are you looking at the moduli of curve together with differential, looking at the locus where you have that and then pushing down the virtual part? Oh, you, you, the question about the, the definition, right? Yeah. The prop, so the proper definition of witness class is a little bit complicated because if you, so as I said, as I said, on every curve you have the zero, uh, the zero one over R, you have the zero section of this uh, R through. So, uh, so if you just do that, you will obtain the whole space. But actually, you have to you, you have to to cut a piece of it using some virtual you know, <coughs> virtual class. Okay. Right. So the R matrix. What is the R matrix? Mm. Okay. Let me start here. So first of all, given tall's R matrix is, is not really a matrix. It's a actually a matrix valued power series. So Z is a formal variable. Formal variable. And this is R0 plus R1Z plus R2Z squared plus and so on. So it's a power series in Z. And R0, R1, R2, Rm is a and n plus 1 times n plus 1 matrix. That contains some information about the cohomological field theory. So now I'm going to tell you how to find the R matrix if you have the cohomological field theory. And then there is uh, Telemann's classification theorem that tells you that you can actually go back in many cases. So let me first tell you what information is contained in the R matrix. So let's so let's take omega G1. Then you just have one marked point, so you just need one number A from 0 to n plus 1. And uh, what you are going to find is a cohomology class on mg1 bar. So I restrict it from mg1 bar to mg1. I think it was a bad choice. I'll, I'll, start, I'll, I'll start again on a, on a bigger spots. So again, omega G1 of A is a cohomology class on mg1 bar and I restrict it to mg1. So mg1 is the modulate space of smooth Riemann surfaces of genus G with one marked point. The cohomology uh, group of mg1 is much smaller. And, well, in particular, there is one cohomology class that is called the Psi, the psi class that uh, Rahul, actually, Rahul Panderipanda introduced this morning. So there is the class Psi 1, uh, which is the, so it's the first churned class of the cotangent lines to this one marked point. Remember, there is one marked point on the, <coughs> on the curve. You take the cotangent line. That gives you a line bundle over mg1, and you take the first churned class. And then there are some other classes that are called kappa classes, and you don't know, you don't need to know what they are, because in a moment they will they will disappear. But just <coughs> to begin, well, I, I list them in, in parentheses, but they will disappear in a moment. Okay, so here we have 
this cohomology class is equal to sum over m psi to the power m this is this class psi 1 okay let me call it psi 1 and then I will write plus O of the kappa classes which means that so just set all kappa i's equal to 0 so whatever is in whatever is well the <coughs> The part of the expression that involves kappa classes, you just forget. You just leave the leave only the part that has that has only the only the class psi one. And then here you have a coefficient that depends on a. So a goes from zero to n, and it also depends on the genus. So here it's g minus one, and g minus one does not go from 0 to n, so I take it modulo n plus 1. I'll rewrite it a little bit. And this gives you the matrices Rm. So once again, you take your homological field theory and you look at a small, at, well, at a small part of it. First of all, you, you restrict to the open part of the moduli space, which is already much simpler than the, the compactification. Then you forget about the kappa classes. If you don't know what they are, it's even better. You don't even have to forget. <laughs> and then, so you just look at the, well, basically one, one part, of one, one component of this cohomological field theory along this this particular cohomology class, the psi class, psi class to the power m. And then for every m, you get a bunch of numbers and they are, uh, and they form this uh, n plus 1 by a n plus 1 matrix. Yes? So this is living in many different cohomological degrees? Yes, this is of cohomological degree to m. But the definition of omega was also living Yes, in yes. So. So remember the uh, omega. So uh, the, my definition of omega for Gromov-Witten theory of, of of CPN. Remember, I said you look at at curves that map to CPN, and that go through uh, some projective subspaces. So it depends on the degree, and you take the sum over all degrees. So it's a mixed degree cohomology class. Now Witten's class is actually pure degree, but. Uh, well, there is some, there is some, well, uh, <coughs> maybe I will mention, there is some, a shift that you, that you, that you do to make it of, of mixed degree and semi-simple. I, I, will, I will mention that in a second. So, they're all of mixed degree. Okay, and then there is Telemann's classification theorem. Classification theorem. That tells you that a semi-simple, I have to write it down, but I will not define it today. A semi-simple cohomological field theory can be uniquely reconstructed, uniquely reconstructed from its R matrix. So this, <coughs> sorry, are yes, these are, so, okay, so now is the good, now is the good, the, the good moment to make this remark. So omega is semi-simple automatically. And Witten's class is actually not semi-simple, but there is a translate, well, an operation called a translation. So you, okay, let's say W tilde sum over k greater than or equal to zero, push forward of Witten's class gn plus k, so here is your Witten's class, and then you add k more marked points, and you put insertions one everywhere. 
you could actually choose any 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 other remainder, but one is the one I'm using today. So instead of taking just one witness class, you take with, with, with n marked points, you use witness class with n plus k marked points with a bunch of ones, and you take their push forward, so you forget these k marked points, you take the push forward and you put them all on the same moduli space MGN bar. And that gives you a, a modified witness class that has, uh, so the degree starts, it starts with witness class and then it has degrees lower and lower. So it's a triangular change of, change of well, a <coughs> triangular change where you start with witness class and then you add some smaller, smaller degree terms that are pushed forwards of witness class on higher <coughs> spaces with more marked points. And this thing becomes semi-simple. And then you can use the R matrix to reconstruct everything. And if you are interested in witness class itself, you just keep the highest, to highest, highest degree part. So it's a, again, it's a technical thing. If you, if you know what I'm talking about, then this is the precise definition. If not, just forget it, forget it and think about witness class. Right. And I managed to do it in half an hour. I think that was the fastest introduction I have ever done into <laughs> Cohomological field theories and R matrices. So that just one stupid yes. question. R matrix has, in this sense, has nothing to do with the R matrices from quantum groups and linking. From the uh, young Baxter equation, no, 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 no. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> it would be a, it would be really surprising. <laughs> but it's the same letter. <laughs> okay. So the summary of all this is that we have. Two important theories, the gromov witten theory of projective spaces and Witten's R-spin classes. And the R-matrix is the most compact way to encode all the information that they contain. So you see, gromov witten theory contains a lot of numbers. You should, you, you, take the, you should fix the degree of the map and all these numbers, A1, An, and the genus and the number of marked points. And for each choice you have a number, so there is a a lot of numbers. And in these matrices, so these matrices, of course, there's still a significant amount of numbers. There's a, well, a square table, with n plus 1 by n plus 1 for, for each Rm. But still, it's a, much, it's a much smaller amount of numbers. And this is the most compact way you can, you can encode a cohomological field theory. So when you want to describe a cohomological field theory concretely, you <coughs> you try to write the R matrix. Okay, so now I will make the connection with the with the differential equation. So maybe I will start, I will still continue about the R matrices. I will start with a concrete recipe. Recipe. Does it take a double E or not? I don't remember. <laughs> For computing the R matrix. So the reason I'm showing this is that this recipe actually, well, this is what makes the connection with the, with the differential equation. Okay, so well, it's a little abstract, but okay. Let, let, so I'll, I'll, I'll write it down the way the way it is. So first of all, there is there are two matrices. two matrices related to the grading of A from 0 to N. 
So you see, h to the a is a cohomology class of degree to a. So there is a natural grading in the cohomology of uh, well, the <coughs> cohomology of CPN. And so there is one matrix that I will denote by a bold face mu. which is just the cohomological degree of A. Uh, so this is called centered, well, centered, centered grading operator. Grading operator. Um, so it starts with minus N, then there is two minus N, and then minus two and N in the end. And I will multiply it by a parameter mu. So for omega, for the Gromov-Witten theory of projective spaces, mu is equal to one half. So it gives you the cohomological degree of A, just shifted in such a way to make this antisymmetric. This is why it is called centered. And for Witten's class, there is no well, there is no cohomology. It's not a, it's not the Gromov-Witten theory of a, of a variety, but there is still a grading, and in this case, mu is equal to one over two r, or one over two n plus two. Okay, and there is another matrix, bold face Xi. And that's the multiplication by the multiplication by the Euler field. So I'm sorry, I am skipping a little bit too much, but this is the last thing I'm skipping. So the Euler field is again related to the same grading. When you have a grading, you also have, a, uh, you, you also have an Euler field. And there is a matrix of multiplication by this Euler field. And this is given, well, this is... This matrix is just a shift by one modulo n plus one. Yeah. And again, I will multiply it by a, by a, by a xi that is not bold face. So this is a this is a parameter. This is a matrix. This is just a number. And here, in both cases the parameter xi is equal to n plus 1. But it would actually be possible to do, to absorb, well, this parameter is easily absorbed into the differential equation. So, again, the moral of all this is that for Witten's class and for the Gromov-Witten theory of the projective space, the actual computation of the R matrix is almost the same. You use the same matrix xi, for uh, multiplying by the Euler field. And the, the centered grading operator is the same up to a constant. The constants are different, but that's the only difference there is. So you would think the R matrices for, for, uh, for these two theories would be very similar. Actually, they are not so extremely similar, but they are related to the same differential equation. And so the recipe itself is the following. Let me write it, yeah. Rm plus 1, so the commutator of Rm plus 1 with this bold face Xi is equal to M plus bold face mu.
times Rm. This is what I use every time I want to compute an R matrix completely. I have it on Maple. So you start, you start with, oh, I, I actually didn't tell you, but, but there's one more condition is that R0 is actually the identity matrix. So the R matrix is complicated starting from R1, but R0 is just the identity matrix, n plus 1 by n plus 1. Why does this determine R? So you start with R0. R0, you know, is the identity matrix. Then you know the commutator of R1 with Xi, right? So the commutator of R1 with Xi gives you almost all coefficients of R1, except for some of them. So there are still uh, capital N plus 1 indeterminates, indeterminates. And then you write the next equation, and you see that for it to be compatible, these unknown coefficients have to have some precise values. So this is actually, uh, this is actually related to the condition of semi-simplicity. So these equations do determine the R matrix completely in the, well, in the case where the cohomological field theory is semi-simple. And uh, it is not completely straightforward. I mean, it's not, it's not like uh, you compute them one by, well, you, you, <coughs> you actually need this equation to find the remaining unknown coefficients of Rm and some coefficients of Rm plus 1. And then if you want to find the remaining coefficients of Rm plus 1, you go to the next equation. Okay, so this is the way you compute the R matrix. And once you have computed the R matrix, you, get, you have all the information about the Gromov-Witten theory. So now let's write Let's look at this differential equation. So maybe, yeah, I have 20 minutes. I think I still can uh, digress a little bit. So. It is actually easy to solve this differential equation. So it's a okay. It's an ordinary differential equation of order n plus one. So it has a vector space of dimension n plus one of uh, linearly independent solutions. And it is actually not so hard to construct a basis of these solutions. So I'll write one solution that starts with one. So I start with one, and then I want the n plus first derivative of the next term divided by x to the power s to be 1. So I write x to the power n plus s plus 1 divided by n plus s plus 1 and I stop at uh, s plus 1, I guess, something like that. Right, so if you differentiate this n plus 1 times, you get x to the s. And this is x to the s times 1. Then I write the next term so that its derivative is equal to this term multiplied by x to the power s. So this will be x to the power 2 times n plus s plus 1. And then I rewrite all these. And I add some more. So 2n plus 2s plus 2, right? I guess what, <coughs> what is it going to be? n plus 2s plus 2, something like that. I hope I'm not doing it wrong, but I think it's something like, I think it's, I think this is correct. And so on. So this is a convergent series that is almost hypergeometric with your table. With some <coughs> small change of variables, you can make it into a hypergeometric series. And this gives you a perfectly well-defined solution of this differential equation. And then you can make another one that starts with an x and another one that starts with x squared. And the last one that starts with x to the n. 
And if you start with x times n plus 1, it doesn't work because then the n plus first derivative of the first term will already be non-zero. So this is the basis of solutions. However, it does not really, uh, it does not really help uh, to have this basis of solutions if you want to, if you want to find the asymptotic at infinity. So S is an integer, or sorry, S is a real number. No, not necessarily. N is an integer, but S is a, S is a, is a, is a real number. By the way, there is a remark, I'm not sure if it's useful, I haven't found any use for it so far, but this differential equation, so it actually n plus 1 and s are exchanged if you, uh, by, the, by the Fourier transform. Right? The Fourier transform um, transforms multiplication by x into, the deri into derivation and vice versa, so it's, uh, maybe there is some, <coughs> some meaning about that. But if s is a real number, what do you mean exactly by this x to the s? It's, uh, it's defined for positive x, positive real x. The, no, nothing. So for, yeah, so for, if s is an integer, you can, you can extend it analytically to the whole complex plane with some, <coughs> some singularities. But in this case, it's just on the real axis, <coughs> real positive axis. Okay, but so now I claim that all of these series that I wrote, so I wrote the first series and the first terms of the other ones, I claim that all of them have the same asymptotic expansion at infinity. So not just the same asymptotic, but the whole asymptotic expansion. That means that they are all the same except, well, up to exponentially decreasing terms. So what is known about the asymptotic expansion of, uh, of these solutions? Let me write it down. Um, first of all, asymptotic at infinity. 15 minutes, okay. So let's try, let's try to, um, let's try to write the asymptotic in this form times x to the power beta, let's say. So what will happen uh, when you differentiate this? So when you differentiate the exponential, you will find omega times the derivative of this, so x to the power alpha minus 1 well, times the same thing. And then there will be a smaller term, actually. When you differentiate, when you differentiate x to the beta, there will be a, <coughs> that will be a smaller term. So, basically, when you differentiate this, you multiply everything by omega times x to the power alpha minus 1. So if you want this to be a solution of the, of the differential equation, you need s to be equal to alpha minus 1 times n plus 1. n plus 1 is the number of times you differentiate, and alpha minus 1 is the power of x by which you multiply every time. And omega to the power n plus 1 must be equal to 1. Right, so there, there's this parameter alpha, so, up, so from now on I will actually switch to alpha instead of s. There is a relationship between s and alpha, you can use either one as a parameter, and from now on I will use alpha. So there is one parameter alpha that, that's, that can work, so any, asymptotic, so any asymptotic of any solution of this equation 
has this form with the same alpha. The only possible alpha is the alpha that satisfies this. And then omegas are different. So omega is uh, n plus 1 root of unity. So if you take omega equals 1, this gives you the uh, asymptotic that is, well, the fastest increasing asymptotic. And this is the asymptotic of all those solutions that I wrote. And then any other omega will give you, well, uh, an oscillating or a decreasing, decreasing solution, well, which is exponentially smaller. So that means that if you look at the vector space of all solutions of this differential equation, almost all of them grow like this, without, with omega equals 1. And then there is a subspace of dimension 1 that grows small, that grows, well, less fast, and then another subspace of co-dimension 2 with yes, even slower growth, and so on. So in the end, you find one unique solution that increases, that, sorry, decreases uh, with uh, fastest, fastest, fastest rate of decrease. <coughs> Okay, but now, but now I will just look at the generic solution and take omega equals 1. So I take omega equals 1. This is enough for us. So this is the asymptotic expansion of... This is the asymptotic expansion of... Uh, sorry, sorry, this is the asymptotic so far for <coughs> almost any solution of this, uh, of this equation. And then there is... There is also a way to determine beta, so it doesn't, it, it does not, uh, beta cannot be determined by this uh, crude uh, estimations, but beta can actually, be, well, you can also determine the value of beta, and beta is equal to minus n over 2 times alpha minus 1. Okay, so this is the asymptotic for all solutions, or almost all solutions of, the, of this differential equation. And if I want the whole asymptotic expansion, it will have the form sum for m greater than or equal to zero, b m x to the power minus alpha m. And then you can take derivatives of this. So if you take derivative number a, it will be the asymptotic expansion will have again the same exponential term. Then there will be x to the power a minus n over 2 times alpha minus 1 times some for m greater than or equal to 0, bam x to the power minus alpha m. So we actually found, yeah, and if you take a equals n plus 1, that's the same as a equals 0 because of the differential equation. If you differentiate n plus 1 times, you get back to, back to phi. So we have found n power series, or n series of coefficients, b0m, b1m, b2m, up to b capital Nm. So these are n power series. And I claim that, so if you write this out actually, if you differentiate, so if you compare, comparing, maybe, okay. Just one, one thing I didn't tell you about the R matrices, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do it now. So then, question, yes. So, uh, I don't quite, this asymptotic, I mean, you can, for example, add uh, some term with a zero asymptotic at infinity, right? Like one over x or something. And then uh, you will have then uh, a different uh, equation on the right. So, you can... Why can't I add, for example, one over x? Mm -hmm. To the right, because I mean, it have uh, zero asymptotic and infinity, so it will uh, contribute nothing to the uh, behavior at infinity, right? So the asymptotic exp okay, the asymptotic expansion is so th this is the leading term, and the asymptotic expansion is uh, everything that is comparable to powers of x. So this thing 
multiplied by a power of x. This is what I call an asymptotic expansion. But the solution itself uh, has exponentially smaller terms. Okay. Okay. Exponentially, exponentially smaller terms. And actually they are given by similar things with other roots of unity here instead of one. So it is also known, so it is also known what they are. Uh, okay, so one thing I wanted to say about the R matrix and forgot, so let me say it now. So when you look at this, this relation, this commutator, uh, it is easy to deduce that, um, so the R matrix, so R0, as I said, is the unit matrix, is the, the identity matrix. And then R1 will have a zero diagonal, then something non-zero just above and here, and zeros everywhere else. And then R2 will have two zero diagonals and something non-zero on the third diagonal, two non-zero coefficients here, and zeros everywhere else. So actually, because of the particular form of Xi, as you see, Xi just uh, adds one modulo n plus one. Because of this particular form of the matrix Xi, the R matrices will have a lot of zeros. And uh, so there will be only one non-zero coefficient on each line or in each column. So if you add them up, if you add all these columns, for instance, you will find a power series that you can call F1 of Z. And then here you will have F2 of Z. and so on. So the R matrix is determined by, sorry, F0, F1, because I, <coughs> I numbered everything from 0 to n. So the R matrix is actually described by n power series, F0 of z, Fn of z. And this is what we found here. Here we also found n, n plus 1 power series with these coefficients. So actually, F A of Z is equal to some B A M, if I'm not mistaken, something like Z, Z, Z over alpha, and there's maybe, yeah, to the power M. So basically, the power series that you see here are precisely the power series that appear in the R matrix. And thus, we have found them all. So I have five minutes left for some examples. I think it will be quite useful because this is, this is a little bit abstract. So <coughs> before, before giving the example, so let me just sum up. So here you have this asymptotic expansion and its derivatives. When you differentiate the eighth derivative and find the derivative a plus one, that automatically gives you a relation between these numbers b, a, m and the next sequence of numbers be a plus one m. And this relation simply is exactly the same as the, this relation between the R matrices. So between the coefficients, when you, when you rewrite this coefficient on the R matrices in terms of these power series of zero Fn, you find exactly the same relations as when you differentiate this asymptotic expansion. So the proof of the main result is actually a simple computation. There is, <coughs> there is nothing, nothing uh, complicated. You hinted that they were, this was not quite enough. That what was? That, uh, using this, you needed also some higher compatibilities. And no, 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 no. These equations determine everything. Just not, just not. Uh, I don't know how to say. So, let, so let let me say it again. You start with R zero, then you know. Then you have this equation where you have R one and R zero. This does not determine R1 completely, just up to some, okay. But then you look at the next equation with R1 and R2, and this equation can be solved only for some particular values of the remaining coefficients of R1. So in the end, it does determine R1 completely. It's just not that, not that you know Rm and you determine Rm plus one for, from this equation. You need 
two, two equations to determine each matrix. So th these FAs give you our matrix for this W code. For everything. So, okay, so let me, okay, so of course, now, now we want to know what are the particular So you see here you have this parameter mu, different values of the parameter mu, and uh, in the differential equation you have the parameter alpha which rep replaced the parameter s. So now we need to express alpha in terms of mu and the expression is alpha equals 1 minus 1 over 2 mu. And s maybe I can recall, is alpha minus 1 times n plus 1. So let's look what it gives for Witten's class and what it gives for CPN. So for Witten's class, mu is equal to 1 over 2r. So this gives us alpha equals 1 divided by 1 minus 1 over r, which is r over r minus 1. And n plus 1 is equal to r minus 1. So alpha minus 1 times n plus 1 is equal to 1. So in this case, we are just using the equation n plus first derivative of psi is equal to x times psi. And this was actually known from singularity theory. So this is not a, this is not a new result. Now let's try for CPN. And for CPN, we run into a small problem, because if you plug mu equals 1 half, you find alpha equals infinity. Maybe this is the reason why people didn't, didn't realize the relation with, uh, with this uh, differential equation before. It's because it does not work precisely for this value of the parameter. But for us, it is actually not a problem at all, because we know the dependence on alpha, so plugging alpha equals infinity is not, is not such a big problem. So let me give you one example. And you will see immediately how it works. So let's take the example of n equals 1. So we're studying the gram of witten theory of CP1 or the three-spin Witten class. Okay. And then we have the formula for following formula for Bm. So Bm is equal to alpha minus 1 times alpha plus 1. 3 alpha minus 1 times 3 alpha plus 1. And so it goes until 2m minus 1 alpha minus 1. 2m minus 1 alpha plus 1. divided by 8 to the power m, m factorial alpha to the m. So plugging alpha equals r to the r minus 1, which in this case is 3 halves. Well, this is pretty straightforward. You just plug it in this formula. And what you find is the well-known power series sum for m greater than or equal to 0, 6m factorial over 2m factorial over 3m factorial, z to the m. And this is Let's call this series usually called A. And this is one of the two power series that appears in the R matrix for Witten's three spin class. The other one is obtained by differentiating this one in the asymptotic expansion. It's almost the same, but you write one. Let me check what is. Um, yeah. One plus six M over one minus six M. And then the rest is the same. So these are 
the coefficients you actually see in the R matrix of Witten's three spin class. Now, if you want to plug alpha equals infinity, so if you plug alpha equals infinity, it just gives you the leading coefficient of this, uh, of this polynomial. You see, it's a polynomial in alpha divided by alpha to the power m. Actually, if you look over there, you will see that it is divided by alpha to the power 2m in the R matrix. So in the R matrix, you have a polynomial of, of degree 2m upstairs divided by alpha to the power 2m. So when you take <coughs> the limit as alpha goes to infinity, it just gives you the leading term 1 times 1 times 3 times 3 times and so on. And so for CP1, plugging alpha equals infinity, you find again 2 power series, so 1 is sum for m greater than or equal to 0, 2m factorial squared over m factorial to the power 3, z to the m, and differentiating this in the asymptotic expansion, you find the second one, 1 plus 2m, 1 minus 2m, times the same thing, 2m factorial squared, m factorial to the power 3, z to the m. Very nice, simple expressions. Unfortunately, they are only so nice for n equals 1, so don't expect them to be as nice for, for, for larger values of n, but still you are... Okay, I, th I, think I, <coughs> I think I'll have to have a couple more remarks, but I think I have to stop, I have to stop here. So, the maybe, okay, one, one, one last remark, maybe, here. So, Bm is actually a polynomial, well, up to this, up to this uh, alpha to the power m, it is actually a polynomial in both alpha and n. So right now I kind of plugged n equals 1, but actually there is one sequence of polynomials in alpha and n that contains all the information about gram of witten theory of all projective spaces for any n, and all Witten's classes for every r, and the, the asymptotic expansions for all our differential equations. Thank you very much. Any question? So, I have two questions. First, I want, um, what is the geometric meaning of the, the differential equation in case of gram witten the theory of CTF, for example? Um, so, it is, yeah, it is what is called the, the Frobenius potential of the, of the Frobenius manifold. So, so, so Witten's class is the cohomological field theory that is associated with the Frobenius manifold that is actually a well-known Frobenius manifold in singularity theory. So it's, it corresponds to the singularity A R minus 1 and um, um, so the singularity A, A R minus 1 is actually obtained from this, well th this, so this thing here, right, maybe x squared, this thing here has the singularity, just, yeah, just, <coughs> has the singularity x to the, uh, ar minus 1 singularity at the origin. And, uh, well, there is a way to construct our matrices for, for, for these Frobenius manifolds using oscillating integrals. And the oscillating integral solves the differential equation. So it's a, well, it's a, it's a bit <coughs> long to explain. Maybe it's something for a discussion after after the after the talk. But it's a it's a let's say it's a different part of the theory. For any for any Frobenius manifold that comes from a from a singularity, you can automatically construct its R matrix using an oscillating integral. Uh, well, for this for for the potential of this uh, the well this this function that gives you the singularity. But, uh, and then, so wh why do you need to take asymptotics, not, not the, like the whole solution? The, the R matrix is the asymptotic of the solution. That's the... 
do, do those uh, other terms have any meaning? Uh, uh, I mean, the terms that you forget uh, while taking up asymptotics do they have? Uh, Yeah, it's a philosophical question. I don't know. They don't. So the yeah. So I yeah. Well, it's it's um, yeah. I don't know. So the, the this is let's say th this is the asymptotic expansion, right? If you take the asymptotic expansion of e to the power minus x at infinity, the asymptotic expansion is just zero. So there is a <laughs> non-zero function, but the the asymptotic expansion is just zero, and the asymptotic expansion is what appears in the appears in the R matrix. So I yeah I don't know how to <coughs> I don't know how to answer why you why you don't take take into account the remaining parts. But the, this is the how it works. Yes. Uh, is there other varieties where you know uh, R matrices explicitly as in this case? Uh, no, it's actually so. I think so. It is it is not frequent for an R matrix to be explicit. So far, I think the only explicit example is actually CP one, and this is what this was the starting point of the. This was Sibyl computed this the the R matrix for CP one. It is rather surprising that no one realized that before. But the, the thing is, there is another way to compute the R matrix for CP1 using localization. And then you get uh, a little bit bigger result. The, so it's the R matrix for the equivariant Gromov-Witten theory of CP1. So it has the equivariant parameter. And, and then it is not, a, not as explicit. And if you have ever used the localization theorem, you know that when you uh, so when you, you, when the localization parameter tends to zero, you get the, the, the well the non-equivalent limit, but it's not so easy to find. Usually, it, it it is the result of some complicated simplifications. So it is not at all easy to look at the formula for the equivalent R matrix and see that it reduces to such a simple form at uh, the non-equivalent limit. Yeah, and another case, yeah, I don't know, no, it's a. Uh, it's not at all, not at all common for it to be explicit. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Dima. Next up, I wanted to ask you whether uh, this method allows you to compute large genus asymptotics uh, for the bit and uh, RK class. Yeah. This is a this is a question that we asked ourselves. I, I, I don't know. It's a, it's work in progress. So may, maybe, but. but uh, you <coughs> for instance, Agalvao's formula for. Uh, what? Agalvao's formula. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not ready for that. That's a very good question. That's yeah, I, yeah. I, I, but I, I'm not I'm not ready to answer. So the <coughs> I'm sure there will be some applications, but so far I'm not sure. The second question yes. I want to ask is whether you have an understanding on this uh, with respect to resurgence. Resurgence. What is resurgence? <laughs> okay, maybe that's a <laughs> maybe. <laughs> the interpretation of this asymptotically small terms as instant instant terms. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, no, yeah. yeah. And okay, good, okay, good question too, but no. <laughs> yeah, no. Any further question? So let's thank you. Okay, thank you very much.